eight months ago, I was sitting inside a motel. The recorder was running, and the killer we were interviewing was sitting at the edge of the bed. He said I was scared that I was killing at first, but not anymore. It's like drugs. First you get addicted, and then you're okay. I call him Simon. It's not his real name. Here's what I can tell you about Simon. He owns a gun, he goes to church, he has children, and he believes that drugs make people go crazy and that addicts should die. Simon killed two men in the last three years. It's possible he killed more in the last eight months. He said his group of vigilantes killed 20 and that they were paid by the police. He gave us their names. Now, before we did the interview, we were told to make sure that Simon was unarmed. That the moment we walked into that room, my photographer, Carlo, over there, should make sure there were no guns. So there we were, sitting in a motel in a city I still cannot name, and then Simon left for the bathroom. So I look at my photographer, and I said, when he gets back, you have to check for a gun. And my photographer looks at me, and he says, what happens if I find a gun? And that's a question that has never occurred to us. So we decided, as a team, not to check. It was something we didn't want to know. Simon said he really wasn't a bad guy. We're not all bad. It's just that some people need killing. None of us understood the sort of work we would do when we signed on to journalism. I didn't. I'm an investigative reporter for Rappler. We've been sued and threatened, called prostitutes and fake news. My bosses have been arrested, our license have been suspended, our reporters have been banned. And still, in spite of all this, my company has allowed me to find men like Simon and the families of those who have been killed, threatened, and harassed because telling their stories allows everyone to understand what it means when a country says some people need killing. I accept this award as a journalist, one of a long, proud tradition of journalists who have held the line across generations through war, through dictators, through torture, through threats of shutdown. I'm honored to stand here today with some of these women whose courage allowed my generation of reporters the right to call ourselves members of what was once the freest press in Asia. I'll tell you what we do as journalists. We try to be balanced. We do our best to hear all sides. We try to, we try to tell compelling stories that will make people understand what it is to be a nine-year-old girl kneeling in the dirt, holding her father's corpse and screaming at vigilantes. And sometimes we succeed. We strive for the truth, but nothing in the code of journalism ethics tells us we need to be neutral. Our silence is consent. For the many young people in this audience who dream of becoming journalists, who think it's a romantic way to save the world and wear bulletproof vests at the same time, that's not the job. The job is to keep the record straight, to tell the truth, to tell the story. Sometimes, if you're lucky, you can stand on a stage like this and say hi to your parents. But that doesn't happen very often. The truth of what it is is that it's terrifying work. My boss will tell you she doesn't scare easily. I do. I am afraid every day. My parents are afraid every day. But we do the job. We tell the stories. The witnesses, the mothers, the daughters, the men and women who risk their lives, they have to live it. We only tell it. It is our honor to do justice to these stories. My name is Patricia Van Lisa. I am a member of the Filipino Free Press. I will do my best to hold the line with the many people in this room and the many people all over the country, as many people did before me, and as I hope you will do long after me. Thank you for the honor.